After watching Midsummer, I knew that I had to watch the 1970s version of The Wicker Man. Why, you may ask? Honestly, Midsummer lifts so much from The Wicker Man and takes so much inspiration from it, as does a lot of folk horror. So, as I was racking my brain trying to figure out what to do this video essay on, and video essay, pfft, I don't do video essays. I mean, this is like a barely a film analysis. This is like a ramblings of this one. This is like a blog post, basically. In going and trying to figure out what to do this video on, I decided I have to watch the 2000s version of The Wicker Man because it's so, it's so bad. And I, in order to figure out what's so good about the original, I had to figure out what's so bad about the remake. Except then I realized something. Guys, it's not bad at all, they're both brilliant, but for two completely different reasons. So while Wicker Man 1970s soars like a beautiful bird among the breeze, showing its beautiful plume of colors and its sophistication, the pinnacle of nature's creation, the 2000s version is basically me in college on St. Patrick's Day as I shout supporting comments to you, make you laugh really inconsistently, am a little annoying, and also throw up in the bushes. And maybe fall into those bushes a little later, okay? College was a time, guys. <laughs> so I decided, guys, we're gonna have to talk about both because both are masterpieces in their own way. Well, the 70s version can be considered, especially by Cinema Fantastique, the Citizen Kane of horror movies. The Wicker Man remake is the Dumb and Dumber 2 of horror movies. So without further ado, and now a message from our sponsors. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Are you sponsored this video? It's, it's downhill from here. the casting because really this is a movie that relies on cast specifically Lord Summer Isle and the police officer so in the 1970s version you have a jovial Lord Summer Isle which is played brilliantly by Christopher Lee in one of his very favorite roles by the way who's jovial he's charismatic he's carefree it's like nothing is on his shoulders especially not the weight of the world or anything like that one understands why people would follow him and that is a sharp contrast to officer howie who is a very proverbial stick in the mud and also very indignant and has a quiet intensity that builds to almost manic proportions Till by the end, Lord Summer Isle is still calm, quiet, and jovial, while Officer Howie is screaming about Christianity to him. Now, the 2000s version does not have any of that. We are granted Sister Summer Isle, who doesn't really have that much of a presence, and I think that's partially what's wrong with the film, or really what's wrong with the writing of the film, because she kind of comes off really generic. And that has nothing to do with the actress's performance. Like, I've seen this actress, Ellen Burstyn, in other roles. She's really good. But the problem is she's just given nothing over here. And you can't work with nothing. On the other hand, you have police officer Edward Malleus, who is played by Nicolas Cage and all of his Nicolas Cage-iness, who can just chew scenery. That's just what he does. At this point, I consider myself a weird Cage expert because I have covered so many movies from Nicolas Cage in this damn channel. And this man can chew scenery like no other. And he has about two modes, by the way. He's either at a three or he's at a 10. God damn it. And as a result, there is no contrast and it makes 
every single thing that Nicolas Cage does even funnier. Because my goodness, is he trying here. He is really trying to make something out of this. And I don't know if that something is good, but it's certainly something. <laughs> and that brings us to our next point. Okay, so let's discuss pacing and intensity. So while the 1970s version of The Wicker Man is a slow burn horror that ramps up to a really intense conclusion, showing an absolute mastery of genre and true understanding of what makes horror scary. Yeah, the 2000s version's at an 11 constantly, and it wants you to know that it's at an 11. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't understand about the 1970s version of The Wicker Man is that it's initially a mystery that builds into a horror movie. It doesn't start out as a horror movie. It starts out as a straight murder mystery kidnapping thing with a little girl named Rowan. And it builds up into horror, showing a mastery of pacing and honestly, a gradual build that leads to a great conclusion. The 2000s version wants you to know it's a horror film from the very first minute that it appears. And I have no problem with that initially because I think that if you're gonna do an adaptation of something, screw it, change around the genre, do what you wanna do. Don't make the same movie twice. But you also need to understand that horror like comedy requires a setup and payoff. So a good jump scare and a good scare in general needs ramping up. You need to get people on edge in order to go and scare them. Hey, wanna play hide and clap? Now this version does not understand them at all as a semi-truck just bursts into the film at random intervals and is the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life, okay? I was dying, it's great, okay? At some point, some woman walks in with bees on her chest, there's no context, oh my God, it's wonderful. <laughs> Where all the fear is built up in the 70s version, it just, farts it away in the 2000s version. <laughs> and that probably had something to do with the script. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how the stories are different. I'm not gonna do some like beat by beat analysis because that would make it a very boring video for both of us. But let's talk about the horror of the personal versus the horror of the impersonal. So the 1970s version of The Wicker Man has a narrative device in which Officer Howie is going to the Summer Isles to go and find a missing girl named Rowan. He is over there for an objective reason. He has no relationship to the people of this island. This is the first time he's ever been there. And as a result, things are revealed organically and through exposition. But in addition, it shows that he doesn't necessarily have a personal bias against these people. So just because I said something is impersonal doesn't mean that personal biases don't come into play. So Officer Howie has some very big personal biases, which is he is very Christian. He does not like other religions. How dare they not know about Jesus? He's indignant, he's furious. Oh, what is all this? I mean, you, you, you've got fake, fake, fake biology, fake religion. Sir, have these children never heard of Jesus? And as a result, it becomes less of a thing about the personal, about Officer Howie versus Lord Summerisle, and more of a conflict of ideology, Christianity versus paganism. So, the 2000s version takes a very different approach to this. Okay, so here's a bit of a pickup because I didn't love my first take the first time and welcome to the process of me moving. It's been interesting. So getting back onto the personal versus the impersonal, Edward Malleus has more of a personal relationship with the island and a personal vendetta because his girlfriend wound up leaving him 
to go back here, to go back home to this place. And he's suspicious from the very beginning. On some level, he does hold these women responsible and it comes off as confrontational. Mostly because he's running around the island searching for his ex-girlfriend, which is a completely different story than the other one. But also because it just comes off like he's running around this island going, Why won't she date me? Why won't she date me? God damn it, I hate this. Oh, sad. Which could be a compelling story. I'm not saying that the horror of personal conflict is not scary. I mean, come on, look at stuff like Hereditary, or The Babadook, or The Fucking Exorcist, which is a deeply personal story about a priest who has kind of lost his faith. And it's also an ideological thing about like faith versus lack of faith. And as a result, this story just isn't built like that. So it just comes off incredibly funny because Leading into my next point, I don't think the 2000s version really understood The Wicker Man at all. Now, I think what makes the 2000s version and the 1970s version really great contrast is because the 2000s version is so desperately trying to be a good adaptation of the 1970s version. It lifts scenes, shots, quotes. Now, sir, if I may have your permission to exhume the body of Rowan Morrison, I was under the impression I'd already given it to you. Now, do I have permission to open the grave of Rowan Woodward? Oh, I was under the impression that I'd already given it to you. Lines, characters from this, but also doesn't understand what any of it means, which is great for all of us. So let's talk a little bit about the phallic symbol scene because it shows up in both and in one it's scary and the other one it is piss your pants funny. In the 1970s version, the reason why it's kind of terrifying, which really breaks apart the terror in its entirety, is the fact that there is just a lot of sexuality in this religion in general, which to a 1970s audience is terrifying because, ooh, you don't talk about that in the 70s, okay? We just finished with the free love stuff. As a result, you have orgies, like in the general street, you have a certain amount of bodiness at the bar, you have an entire weird fertility scene where a woman humps a door and sings a weird song to this police officer. It's very laden with sexuality. So once you get to the scene of the children saying phallic symbol, phallic symbol, phallic symbol in the classroom, it's not scary because you have children saying phallic symbol. The phallic symbol. That is correct. Okay, so I'm not the biggest fan of my performance for this episode, so I'm gonna have to do another pickup. Fine. So the reason why the 1970s version's phallic symbol scene is so terrifying is because a bunch of weird stuff has been going on before this scene. You have the weird naked orgies, you also have like several bizarre ceremonies as well. This is the culmination of the weirdness. The fact that you are having a bunch of children say phallic symbol, phallic symbol, phallic symbol without even a giggle is a little unusual. It's not necessarily because they're saying anything like phallic symbol. It's the fact that they're saying phallic symbol in the same way that they would say tablecloth. It's just a weird juxtaposition. Now, the 2000s version gives a very different spin on this, and it makes it a big deal from the beginning. Not only do you get an entire speech about how men are objectively stupid and ridiculous and bad. Quixotic. From Don Quixote, pursuer of lofty but impractical ideals, usually a man. But for some reason, all of these little girls have a weird, irrational hatred of grown men, despite it's hardly seeing any. And this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. They make such a big deal about this, and they want it to land as a creepy moment so badly. Yes. Phallic symbol, phallic symbol. <laughs> but they can't do it because they have not set up anything else. And they've just like shoehorned, they've turned duck in this scene into the turkey duck and chicken. 
that is this movie, and it makes not a bit of sense. Objectively, give this a bunch of Razzies. Please, 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 please let them make another movie of this because it's great. So finally, let's talk about the messaging of this film. Well, these two films, because they could not be more different. Uh, they're practically unrelated. So as I've reiterated many times, the 1970s version of The Wicker Man is all about Christianity versus paganism. It's part of a subgenre called folk horror, which focuses on specifically folk religions and why they're terrifying. It's kind of a weird genre as a whole, and it focuses on the idea of older religions superseding the new boy in town, Christianity. And as a result, it's a great messaging movie. Like, it objectively knows what it's about and wants to tell a story about the battle between old religion and new religion. How does it go into that? How does it even go and illuminate the themes besides the characters? Why it goes into the religion itself? There's a lot of stuff you learn about the Summer Island, the Summer Isles people religion. Like, you get to learn about their specific midsummer ceremony. You get to learn a little bit about their religious practices, their multiple gods, their stuff that has nothing to do with any like harvest or anything like that, or anything to do with Sergeant Howie. You just get to learn a lot about the island. Now the 2000s version has a completely different message. And let me tell you, I tried so damn hard to read any other message besides, my goodness, this film hates women into this film. But you know when I knew that this film hated women so much? You bitches! <laughs> you bitches! <sighs> yeah, it was that moment. It was really that moment. That is when I'm like, God damn it. Yeah, it's about how much this guy hates women. And let me tell you why I was trying to read a non-feminist message into this, because every single damn time I talk about feminism or women's issues on this channel, there is one butthurt person who goes into the comments and talks about why you have to bring up feminine. Like, okay, dude, you don't have to watch it. You don't have to watch this review. I, like, if, if you have a problem with it, maybe sit out those ones. And if you expect me to jump on my high horse and talk about, oh my goodness, this film is so problematic. Oh my goodness, the messaging of it. No, uh-uh, I think this film is funny. This film is hilarious, okay? The writer obviously is terrified of women. You know what he thinks happens when women get together? We talk about how much we hate boys and how much we love murder. And let me tell you, only one of these things is true. I'll let you figure out which one. Because my goodness, my goodness, is he just going and driving home how much these women hate men? If it's not the previous line I mentioned, it's Nicolas Cage running into a room and seeing a bunch of men and going, what the hell's wrong with you boys? I need your help, all of you. Come on, can't you hear me? I said I need your help. Don't be afraid. Okay. My God! Oh, it's so funny. It is so funny. I love the fact that this man is obviously terrified of women. I love it. And the worst part is, he is given so many opportunities to not make it about this. Like, you could have brought up the religion of this Summer Island so many times, but boy did he not. He did not do any of that. At every opportunity to bring up the specifics of the religion, they sidestep it. They just throw it away and they're like, oh, but women, oh, women getting together. <laughs> women solidarity, they're here to kill us. And Honestly, A plus, A plus. Don't expect me to get mad. I think it's funny that I haunt your dreams. I hope 
that a bunch of women get on board with this movie because it's the funniest thing I've ever seen, okay? This is an incel's worst nightmare and I love it. I objectively adore it because, my God, you missed the point! And it was spelled out! Like, the 1970s version is not subtle and spells it out for you, but in the 2000s version, it decided to take the point and, like, hurl it across the other side of the room and go, God, I hate women! So, in conclusion, the 1970s version is a great homage to horror itself. But the 2000s version just, oh no, it, it, it poops the bed. It pooped the bed a little too hot. No, not the beast! Not the beast! Ah! I'm losing my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! <laughs> no wonder it got memed. Anyways, I'm Bridget Bardot. For all you know, your girl behind the counter. And uh, if I can be your B cult leader by the end of this, I hope I am. Any ladies who are watching this, let's make a let's make a weird B cult together, okay? Let's haunt this man's dreams. Let's watch this movie and love it. Okay. Candidly, I love this movie like I love women of the avocado forests of death, uh, which is another movie about how feminism is scary and is inadvertently the funniest thing I've ever seen. So I'm Bridget Bardot for all you know, your girl behind the counter, and I talk about movies you don't give a shit about, especially if it is terrified of women itself. Uh, so of course, like, comment, subscribe for even more movies you don't give a shit about, and follow me at official girl behind the counter on Instagram, and Bardot for all you know on Letterboxd, and I will see you in the next review where there is hopefully a lot less misogyny but the misogyny was funny. <laughs>